and sisters, one more time, I welcome everyone to this Surefire live conference platform. The platform that the Almighty God has given to us to hear his word, to make simple, clear, and available the pathway to eternal life. That's what we are here for, to learn his ways and to live by it. So God Almighty bless you from wherever you are joining, whether on Zoom, on Facebook, and, and whichever country you are joining from. So we have been dealing with the topic, the love of God. The love of God. Praise the name of the Lord. In this teaching series on the love of God, we have covered, and I believe we understand, a number of uh, key points which I will enumerate. We have covered and we understand the love of God, what it means. That his steadfast love extends to the heavens, and it is, that means the love of God is infinite. Number two, we have also looked at the definition of love. And in fact, we have made the categorical statement that there is only one love, really, because God is love. And that when we say love, we are talking about that one love. People talk about all sorts of love, but that's why there is confusion. There is only one true love, and that is the love of God. And this is the love God is calling us to practice. And so we have covered the definition of love, the true love, that love does no harm to his neighbor. Love does no harm to another. Rather, love seeks the well-being of another. Number three, we've covered the characteristics of love, the characteristics of love. And you can look at that again listed in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, precisely verses uh, 4 to 8. Number four, we've also looked at the distinction between human motivated ambitions or selfishness as alluded, alluded to by Maslow theory, Maslow theory of motivation, and the unconditional benevolent love of God. So I'll state that again, that number four point that we have covered is the distinction between human motivated ambitions or selfishness, as alluded to supported by Maslow theory of motivation, that all the five hierarchy of human motivation human by human needs are all based on human selfishness. Nothing wrong with it. As long as we recognize that is all about human selfishness. And now God is calling us to the real love, to be motivated by love. So the distinction between human motivated ambitions or selfishness and the unconditional benevolent love of God. Point five, we have covered the lo that love is the highest hierarchy of life. Love is the highest hierarchy of life. Love sits above spirituality. So only love guarantees eternal life because God is love and he who loves abides in God and God in him. To make that clear, you see, the devil is also spirituality, but it is a negative spirituality. The devil cannot love. The devil only hates. The, the devil only destroys. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus Christ was the one who said it. He said, the thieves comes not but to steal, to kill. So that's the duty of the devil. 
to steal, to kill, to destroy. SKD, SKD, to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's the work of the devil. And on the second part of that same scripture, Jesus said, I have come. Hallelujah. This is love. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So hear it from me and hear it clearly. Point number five, I repeat it, that love is the highest hierarchy of life. Love sits above spirituality. Only love guarantees eternal life. Only love guarantees eternal life. Praise the name of our God. Then point number six, which we did last Sunday, that love, or to live in love, to live, walk, practice love. One must practice the three components of love, which are compassion, forgiveness, and sacrifice. That to live in love practically, to demonstrate Love, one must practice. It is a must practice. The three components of love, which are compassion, forgiveness, and sacrifice. Compassion, we know, it means to be sympathetic towards somebody else who is in distress with the mind to helping that person. Forgiveness. We know, you know, I just use the word we know, but if you ask many people, what is forgiveness? I tell you, many will struggle. We use some of these words without really paying attention to them. But they are important things we should pay attention to because they define life itself. No wonder there is so much confusion in the world because the world has left the foundation of life and are running after nothing. Forgiveness, it means to pardon an offender. It, it means to pardon an offender. Then consider that offender and treat that person as not guilty. You just pause for a moment and think about that. So somebody offends you. Forgiveness. If you say, I have forgiven you, I've forgiven you, have forgiven me, I have forgiven you, it means that I pardon that offender and I consider and treat that offender as though he was never guilty. That's exactly how God treats us. He forgives us all our sins. He removes all the guilt away. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Glory be to God. So, the third component of practical living in love, component of love, is sacrifice. Sacrifice. And we know what sacrifice is, isn't it? Oh, mothers know this so well. Oh, mothers, mothers know this so well. I remember my mother, every time I use the word sacrifice, I will almost feel like shedding tears. My mother will not eat if he has not made sure her children have eaten. Sacrifice. She will give whatever she has to help another person that is in need. Sacrifice. So sacrifice means giving up and surrendering of yourself. Sometimes it is your right for a godly purpose, for a godly purpose. Praise the name of the Lord. This is the one that is motivated by love. When it is for a godly purpose, you do it because of God. 
you do it to another person. You know, there are many people who do sacrifice, but it is for another purpose. It is for selfishness. That's why we clearly made the distinction between the love of God, the true love, and the human motivations, uh, selfish motivations, uh, um, uh, uh, selfish ambitions, all that. Praise the name of the Lord. That sometimes look like love, but yet behind it is all self, 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 according to Maslow's theory of human motivation, which is indeed a very true and correct observation of human beings. But God is calling us to come to the higher life. Oh, glory be to God. To come to be in that image and nature of God that God has given to us by his Holy Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. So let's look at our text again. Our text is taken from Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. But hope does not disappoint because the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, who was given to us. Glory be to God. So we have the Holy Spirit, and all that is required now is for us to release ourselves so the Holy Spirit will walk the love of God through us. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, or you don't have the confidence that you have the Holy Spirit, it is simple. Come to Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And tell him, Lord Jesus, you died for my sins. Forgive me my sins. Almighty God, give me your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. If you repent genuinely and pray that prayer, you will have a visitation of the Spirit of God. The guilt will be away, will be taken away. And you will know that indeed God has forgiven you. Next is that you just walk by faith and love. That's what we're talking about here. Praise the name of the Lord. So our focus today is to continue with living in love. That is the practical steps of manifesting and demonstrating love. We want to look at two key elements or uh, aspects of this. Number one, justice and the love of God. Justice and the love of God. Number two, chastisement. That is discipline as love practice. Discipline, chastisement as love practice. This is where sometimes we make mistakes. Our inability to, to understand and balance Justice as a practice of love sometimes make us to ignore the things that we ought to speak up, make us not to stand up for the things we ought to stand up for, because we think that the other attributes of the Holy Spirit, particularly gentleness and meekness, will be undermined when we stand up for justice. But justice is a component of love. So that's why we have to treat this in practical living of God's love. Living in love, the practical way. We must understand the place of justice as a subset of love. Justice and the love of God. Let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 42. He says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe, mint, and rue, and all manner of hex, and pass by justice and the love of God. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. You tight mint and rue, but you pass by justice and the love of God. This you ought to have done without leaving the others 
undone. And I told you, if you go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, this same scripture, this same word that Jesus spoke, there it is captioned that this justice and the love of God is called weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters. So for those of you who are still struggling around with and quarreling over tithes, and all manner of activities, religious activities. Remember, the weightier matter is justice and the love of God. So Jesus here said that the critical thing is justice and the love of God. Justice means the maintenance or administration of what is just, or assignment of merited reward or punishment. Look at that, merited reward or punishment. Merited reward or punishment. That's justice. Praise the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 13, 1 to 10 is a long read. Uh, we will come to that. Before we do that, let's look at Psalm 82, verse 3. Psalm 82, verse 3. The Bible says, Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. This is what God expects of us. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. I'm quoting mostly from New King James Version or King James Version as the case may be. So God says we are to defend the poor and fatherless and do justice to the afflicted and needy. If you look at King James Version and you type the word justice, you would have so many references of justice. No wonder the scripture there says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, that justice and mercy and the love of God is the weightier or are the weightier matters. They are the weightier matters. God said, it is our duty. It is our responsibility of law to defend the poor and fatherless and do justice to the afflicted and needy. When we defend the poor and fatherless, we are actually doing justice. That's what the scripture is teaching. In fact, if you look at it in King James Version, it actually says, defend the poor and fatherless, colon. Colon, which means it's now defining what that defend the poor and fatherless are. He said, do justice to the afflicted and needy. In Psalm 89, verse 14, Psalm 89, verse 14, the Bible says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. This is the Bible talking about God himself. Justice and judgment. Justice, the maintenance or administration of what is just of righteousness, fairness. It says, is your habitation and judgment, which is the execution of justice itself. Hallelujah. Judgment, bringing to the manifestation as we said before, whether it is reward or punishment, judgment, executing that reward or judgment on the one who merits or the one who is guilty. It says, ah, the habitation of God's throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Praise the name of the Lord. So, 
as leaders, people who are in position to lead, as Christians, we are to practice justice. We are to be fair and equitable. Let's look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 10. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And here we're talking about authority that is from God. We're not talking about evil authorities. We're not talking about oppressors claiming that they are from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. We'll come to that. Three, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Now you understand what is the authority that the Bible is talking about here. Because at times some very wicked people will claim this scripture and say they are the authority God has set. God didn't set you anywhere. If you're wicked, you are a wicked person, you are a wicked devil that the devil has put there. And so we, as children of God, will resist you and cast you out because you are a wicked devil. And all those who have ganged up to practice wickedness, oppression, against the people that they are supposed to be rulers who practice justice. The almighty God has his own judgment against you. Let's read verse four. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Can you see that? So the rulers, the leaders, are supposed to be God ministers who help to execute the judgment of God. So whether it is reward to the one who does good, praises to the one who does good, or avenge to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's verse 4 of Romans chapter 13. Let's read verse 5. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Six. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Can you see that? For we pay taxes, and we have to pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Seven, render therefore to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Eight, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not be a false witness, you shall not covert. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now you can see how justice is part of law. So here, the summation of this entire text from verse 1 to 10 summarizes it under law. So justice is part of law. 
if you look at many government, if you look at many rulers, you will see that this is not the practice. Instead, it is oppression. Let's look at God himself, whom the scripture describes in that Psalm 89 verse 14 and says, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. So God dwells in justice and judgment. The same God that is love, his throne is made up of. His habitation, hallelujah, is justice and judgment. Let's look at Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. I read. And the Lord passed before him and pro proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Praise the name of the Lord. This is God. So justice is embedded in law. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, See, the Bible says that God kills and make alive. In fact, God was speaking. He said, I kill and make alive. I wound and heal. I know there are some Christians at times when we want to fulfill the command of Jesus Christ that say we should cast out the devil. And we will say, pray, pray. According to Jeremiah chapter uh, 10, verse 11, I believe, he said, the gods that did not create the heavens and the earth, let them perish from under this heaven and from this earth. So we say, ah, no, that kind of prayer, there is no love there. You're deceiving yourself. So you must understand love and understand justice in love. In fact, any time a Christian comes to me and says, I want to go for an election, want to be part of politics, I always ask one question. I would paint a scenario. I say, imagine that you were sitting and you are the final authority as a person in government, and they brought to your table a judgment that a thief has to be executed, will you sign that document? And do you know, sometimes someone will tell me, no, I will not sign. I am a Christian, I'm born again. And I will shake my head and say, then please don't go into politics. Don't go and take that position in the government because your Christianity has not matured yet in love to know what is justice. You are there to make sure that that person is not brought unjustly. You must make sure that everything that needs to be done to make the society good and well and righteous is done. But if you are the person in that office and all that has been done correctly as it ought to be done, Justice, who that has set that law, just as we read in Romans chapter 13, what is just is you should sign. If you don't want to sign, leave that work. Come and do pastoral work like myself. So you will not come into that space. So you'll be on this side of teaching people what forgiveness means, what pardon means, and what justice means. Praise the name of the Lord. So Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, God said, I kill and I make alive. 
I wound and I heal. You see, when God kills a man, it is called justice. Glory be to God. We are not warring against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And Jesus has given us his name to cast every power of darkness down. Cast them out. And so, part of your justice is to cast out the devil. If there is anything in your neighborhood that is troubling your peace, you are to bring peace into that neighborhood and tell that wickedness it must cease. But our weapons is not by flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and bringing to subjection everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Glory be to God. Let's look at Jesus Christ, who is the epitome of humility, of gentleness, of meekness. Because we make a lot of assumptions. In Mark chapter 11, 15 to 18, you can go and read it because of time. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So if you go there, you remember what happened. He drove out those who were selling, buying and selling in the temple. He drove them out. And then he, he made this statement. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it to a den of thieves. He stood up. In Matthew chapter 26, 63 to 64, Matthew 26, 63 to 64, if you go there, you would see he was invited to the house of a Pharisee to eat with the Pharisee. Oh, sorry, that is uh, Matthew, Matthew 26, 63, 64. Sorry, this is where Jesus defended who he was or who he is. Sorry, uh, let's, let's go there. You will hear that Jesus did not answer, he kept silent while he was being accused. Remember, he has taught us, say, when they slap you on this uh, cheek, turn the other side. But in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus helped us to understand how to practice that. Look at 63, standing for justice. So Jesus was always silent, but whenever the question was about who he was, or whether he was the son of God, he never kept quiet. So you must know that. Look at it. In verse 63, he said, But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, thereafter or hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Look at 27, 11 and 12, 27 and 12, 11 and 12. He said, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. He knew when to keep quiet. He knew when justice must prevail and when to speak up. And you hear many theories, people who say Jesus never said he is the son of God. Oh, what a lie. If Jesus didn't do this, those people would have succeeded in deceiving the whole world. But Jesus spoke any time the question was, 
Are you the son of God? He will answer. Jesus is unequivocally the son of the living God, the savior of the whole world. He was an epitome of love, yet he knew how to practice justice. Praise the name of the Lord, and he's calling us to do the same. Finally, we look at chastisement, and then we take some discussion. When we are disciplined, most times, again, wrong assumptions. We assume some parents would think that it is by not um, addressing issues that they have practiced love. No, that is not love. Praise the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. So let's read from verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons, my son. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Six, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Chastening means discipline. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Can you see now? So children, and we are all children, subordinates, and leaders, discipline is part of love. Let's read verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and leave? 10. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. 11, the last verse we'll read. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The world goes around trying to tell children to dig back to when their parents disciplined them. And then they began to teach them hatred for their parents, hatred for their family, hatred for life, and all what not. Get confused. Discipline that has produced that results. Some people have become very successful by the discipline that they went through. And yet the world teaches them to dig back and, and claim their right. They were treated unfairly, but they are not able to pay back what the, 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 the result that that has brought in their lives that have put them where they are. Of course, this must be balanced with what we said before, justice. So no discipline must be done out of revenge or anger, nor must it be done as an offense, but it must be to correct the ills and help another person or the society. A very good example of discipline is in the space of sports where coaches will subject the athletes to st strict discipline, discipline of what they eat, discipline of their routines, and they will do this. 
You need to study the life of an Olympian. You will see that they went through a lot, discipline, to achieve that gold medal, to stand upon that podium. So discipline. The Bible teaches us here that we have to balance discipline. So both the one who is disciplining because you are the leader or head and the one who is receiving. The one who is giving the discipline must do it in love, out of love, never as a revenge, never out of anger, never out of offense, but and never out of your own selfishness, but with a view to correcting and helping that person to get better. Praise the name of the Lord. I think I want to pause it here because I would want practical situations discussed for the few minutes that we have, and then we can pray. So let's go on to the discussion now. Good morning, sir. My question is around forgiveness. You know, in last week's teaching, there's a part where you brought up the question of Jesus. And when they asked him, should I forgive my brother seven times? And then he said, no, it's 70 times 70 uh, times. I mean, for somebody to offend you 490 times, the, the person will most really, even the devil, I'm not sure can do that in a day. So my question is, it's really about that forgiveness. You know, when people, offenses come, but as a person, I struggle a lot with that thing about forgiveness. Yes, I'm forgiving the person. You know, they say forgive and forget, but I'm unable to really forget. You know, sometimes I find out that I don't remember them. You know, but some that really haunt me, it just stays. Some days, you, I don't want to... Thank you. Thank you, my brother. I think I get your question. So, I let me uh, test whether this is really the depth of it. You're, you're, prob you're, you're not struggling with the fact that you are to forgive, but it is the fact that you keep remembering, and when you remember that hurt, still is still there comes back is that right yes sir so it is indeed healing i will put it this way it is healing the hurt of past offense you are willing to forgive in fact you have forgiven but how do i get the healing because the hurt is still there I want to rephrase it that way because that's what will bring the healing. Forgiveness, you have forgiven. Lord, I forgive. Yet, you will remember. Yes, we are human. We have memories. We will remember. But as you heard, that pardon or the definition of forgiveness, it says to pardon an offender and consider and treat the person as not guilty, not guilty. It is not easy by just the flesh. It is by the help of the Holy Spirit. So what you do is every time that thought, because you have accepted the command of God to forgive, every time that hurt comes, you will just ask Holy Spirit, please help me. And don't wait till the hurt comes. You should actually pray and say, Lord, heal me of this hurt. Heal me of this pain. I forgive and I forget. There are situations, we call them triggers, triggers. There are similar situations that will happen in life. And once they come, it will trigger that memory. But if you have been healed, I tell you the truth, 
even when that memory is triggered, you'll be able to smile over it. You won't feel the pain, you won't feel the hurt. You will just, so your memory is not dead. You will remember. So let's be factual about this. But it is the emotion that was attached to it that the spirit of God will heal you of. And you'll be able to know that, look, I have passed through this. I am here alive. I've gone through it. It has nothing to do anymore with my life and in my life. And that's one thing I often tell people when I'm counseling. I say, know that anything you have lived through and didn't kill you, you are still here, has nothing to do with your life. If you sit down and bemoan that past, you're hurting yourself the more. It is actually for your own good and benefit. In fact, you must come to also know that forgiveness is actually for your own good and benefit. Because most of the time, the hurt we feel, that person is not feeling it. The person maybe has capacity to just forget things and has forgotten and gone. And you're living with the hurt and pain. So forgiveness is actually for your own healing. It's for my own healing. It's for the healing of the offender. So I hope, I know many people are in, in this space. So you must deal with it. How do you deal with it? You must, before God say, I forgive this person. And now ask the spirit of God to heal you of the hurt, of the pain. And continually, whenever that trigger comes up, do the same and say, I have forgiven. Lord, heal me of the pain and the hurt. It will go. I can tell you that. And number two, raise yourself and know that anything you have passed through and it didn't take your life and you are here has nothing, no power over you. So it is your choice to move on. Make up your mind to move on and leave. That's uh, my response to that. And I pray, yeah, I pray the Spirit of God heal you and every other person who, are, uh, who has been hurt in one way or the other. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, any other question, clarification, contribution? Father, there's someone in the chat. Okay, read the question. He says, Pastor, you mentioned three components of love. Compassion, forgiveness, and sacrifice. Yes. I have also personally created what I call the hierarchy of love. Number one, love of God. Number two, love of family. Number three, love of one's neighbor. Number four, love of church. Please, can you comment on this, my personal hierarchy of love? There is no such hierarchy of love. It doesn't exist. So let's leave the love of God. And the love of God clearly says what that love is. In Luke chapter 10, so let's look at it. I, anything I, I created, I didn't create by myself. I read it from the scripture. So when you create one, read it from the scripture. So he's... Luke chapter 10, let's look at verse uh, uh, 27 again, but let's start from 26 or 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. It was a test, right? Saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your spirit heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So, love for God, love for yourself, love for your neighbor. So every other person falls in your neighbor. That's what I've been teaching here, that that's the segmentation that the world creates, right? 
However, in the physical dimension, yes, there is the what if you go that route, then you will hear some people talk about um, uh, um, agape love, which is uh, the love of God. A filial love, which is the love for your family, and then they talk about eros, eh? um, sexual love. Those two that we call love, they are attachments. The love that you have for your family is actually God's training for humankind to live in love. But humankind would, after that training, dump it and practice selfishness once they get out of that. That emotional love, attachment, husband and wife, God created it to train up human beings so they can live the love of God, which is indeed the true love. So love is not really different. If you come to that definition, you will understand the true love of God. You understand the characteristics of love. And once anything doesn't have that characteristic, it is not love. So let's not create that hierarchy of love. It will not go against the scripture when we subject it to a lot of tests. So the Bible says we should love our neighbors as ourselves. But it is that same love of God that God is saying we should love. I would not call it hierarchy because when you say something is hierarchy, it means that something is higher than the others. So every love that we practice must come from the true love of God. So we can then practice it. So I will call it the domain of expressing love. That your hierarchy, I will call it the domain of expressing the love of God. I will not call it hierarchy. So, and that those are natural domain. Actually, I normally talk about four domains, but I call them responsibilities. So we have responsibilities to God. We have responsibilities to ourselves. We have a responsibility to our family, and then we have responsibilities to others. This is how we naturally interact. In this domain, you will always interact. And we must show love, that same love of God in this whole domain, not to any lesser degree. Because when you say hierarchy, it means there is a degree. It must be to the same degree. That's what God's law teaches. I hope that uh, addresses that. Uh, we are eight minutes past 12, but we're in practical session. So uh, if you don't mind, Let's uh, take it till uh, quarter past 12, please. This is important things to deal with. Because after this, we're going to take assignment. Yes, uh, uh, Sister Gertrude, your line is open. Please go for it. Yes, thank you very much, Pastor, for talking on forgiveness. Yes. Um, I was sharing the other day with my sister Comfort and on an issue that I had, an experience I had. And I started finding myself weeping, crying. Glory. Then I asked myself, haven't I forgiven or forgotten what really happened? <laughs> but I was somehow embarrassed because Sister Comfort is my younger sister and <laughs> I was weeping in front of her. But the explanation you just gave now on forgiveness uh, really helped me. I said that we, we need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to really clear whatever had happened. But I yeah. thought I had uh, dealt with the issue, but for me to be crying or something yes. else. Yes, you have dealt with the issue. You are human. That's, we have memories. Nothing has wiped away the thing from your memory. So that's why, and that's why, as I talked about triggers, there are triggers often. It could be internal trigger, it could be external trigger. We must know that. But you have been equipped by the Spirit of God to address and handle that trigger 
So the problem is when we don't know and don't understand this, we can either drop into guilt and think, oh, I haven't forgiven. You see, the same way when you ask God for forgiveness, you believe that God has forgiven you. The same way when you be stand before God and tell God, I have forgiven this person, you should believe, accept that it is done. But the physical uh, memory, uh, faculties, and both in, which internal, internally may trigger something or external remember, um, events may trigger when it triggers, you are to uh, defend it. Let me use the right word. That's how to defend, ward it off by again reminding yourself that before God, I have forgiven this person. And like I said, the pain side, the hurt side, you ask the spirit of God to heal you. It requires healing. And um, you can also you know, seek prayer if it is something that it's, uh, really uh, difficult for you to deal with alone. But it's not because you haven't forgiven. It's not because you haven't dealt with. It's just because we are human and we have emotions. And it takes the spirit of God to heal that emotion when uh, some deep wounds have occurred. Thank you very much. Um, any other contribution, comment, question? And again, I want to speak to uh, the person who asked that question around the uh, hierarchy, please. I, I hope you understand me. I'm not undermining your, uh, the, you, what you try to create. Yeah, it is that when it comes to love, remember, I've taught us that it is the highest level of life. It is higher than spirituality. And I did make that, I, I, as we conclude, I'm gonna um, uh, share those uh, slides. So, yeah, so that's what uh, we have to be careful. Um, as I said, I would call them the domains of expressing love. So indeed, very good appreciation that you have done that, you have made that thinking, but you have to lift yourself above that. That's the way physical human beings look at love. But we are not just ordinary, we, are been, we have been recreated by the spirit of God. And we are talking about the same love that God exhibits. That's the love that has been given to us by the spirit of God the love of God. And that's the love God asks us to practice. Is that love that we are then expressing to God, to one another, and to ourselves, not any less. Any other comment? We have two more minutes from the time I promised. Okay, Pastor, can I come in? Yes, please. Now, I'm, I'm quite, I'm a little bit confused about love being the highest form of life and spirituality, or higher than spirituality. Can you explain a little bit? You know? Okay, yes, I explained it earlier. Maybe it wasn't coming clear. You see, when we talk about spirituality, we're talking about this, a spiritual life, right? So, um, so you have the devil there as well, isn't it? And we know that the devil hates. So it's possible for somebody to attain very high spirituality and yet doesn't practice love. That's what we're talking about. So... The practice of love has to be a conscious decision, a conscious choice. One can develop the gift of the Holy Spirit and decide to be unkind, yet not because he doesn't have the spirit that would make him kind, but he chooses not to be kind.
one example is the self ambition, selfish ambition, selfish ambition. One may develop very high spiritual uh, life, powers, manifesting the gifts, and yet driven by selfish ambition. And most of the time, that ambition has been catastrophic, even for very big men of God. So, thank you that you've asked this question. And let me make a very fundamental point. So, if you've grown, you've grown in spirituality. And you are one of those that have believed now, oh yeah, the wall is under your foot, uh, your, your feet. Look at yourself again because you have just started your fall. So love is, God is love. That's what the Bible says, God is love. And he who practices love, the love of God, that's why you hear me when uh, that person was talking about hierarchy. I am sharp in putting it right, because love is being in God and God in you. It's a decision to manifest God completely, totally, not hold back anything. That's how love is higher than spirituality. The devil is the negative spirituality. Jesus is the positive spirituality. God is the positive spirituality, right? But above that, God alone exists in love and wants us, his children, to live in love. That is why love is higher than spirituality. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 13 dealt with this very thoroughly, and I, and, and I have treated that, uh, if we can remember. Let's just get back to it so there's no confusion. Now look at the spirituality that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 listed. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels that have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, can you see that? And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So it is possible to attain this height of spirituality and yet not have love. And not make up your mind to allow the Holy Spirit to leave the agape love. You can, people can still sit at that level of hierarchy of love. I love my family, I love my congregation, and then the others do me, I do you. And then still being motivated by selfishness, which many have made shipwreck of their faith and have caused untold catastrophe to even the world at large as we are experiencing now. So I want to call on leaders at all levels. Stop oppression. Political leaders, stop oppression. Leaders in offices, stop oppression. Let us live in love. And let us walk in love. Leaders in families, fathers, mothers, stop oppression. Let us live in love. Praise the name of the Lord. Let us pray. I think our time is far spent. Uh, but Sister Getru, does that do it for you? Otherwise, you can study 1 Corinthians chapter 13 again. And so in that 1 yes. Corinthians chapter 13, uh, the last verse, verse 13, you remember verse 13 says love. Yes. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of this is love. So we see that love is the greatest. That's how love is higher than spirituality.
let us pray. Ah, let us thank God who has taught us his word. We are now armed with all this. Beloved, like our sister asks, why is love higher than spirituality? It's because this is living the life of God. It is a tough life. There is something called tough love, tough love, which is what discipline is, which is what uh, justice is. You know, being fair, tough love, to live. So it's not every time that you have to turn your back and you think it is love. You must always allow the spirit to teach you. I told us, so love is a matter of the heart and a choice. You choose. It's not just assumptions. You make up your mind, I'm going to live in love. You make up your mind, I'm going to love that person. Our time, really, uh, I, I should have read one story for us, but uh, I think we should go. It's the story of uh, the truth and reconciliation, the one of South Africa. There was a man who killed a woman's uh, son and later came, took the husband and killed it in front of the man. And during the truth and reconciliation, uh, after the man's confession, they asked the woman what she wanted. And uh, because the, the son's body was burnt, the woman said what she wants is for the man to go and exhume, bring the, the son's body so that she can give uh, the son a, a, a befitting burial. And then she should come, oh, it was the husband's body yeah, that was burnt. She should bring the husband's body so she can give the husband a befitting burial. And then she should come and stay with her every week so she can show her the kind of love that she ought to be showing to her son. And the third one, that he should come right there in court or the tribunal and embrace her so that he will know that she has forgiven him and she walked over to embrace the man. The man collapsed as the story had it because this was love demonstrated and justice. She maintained the justice side of it and she showed the man love. I've forgiven you, but you've got to do what has to be done by the law. Yet I have forgiven you and showed him forgiveness. So let's go before God. You, this message has touched you. It has challenged you. You that has problem in your marriage, you are showing love, and instead of getting the response of love, you get hatred. You get uh, um, exploitation. You are saying, God, what is the answer? The Holy Spirit has an answer for you. Just ask God, help me. But make up your mind to love. Never, never, never get into that space of resentment, that space of depression. Let the Spirit of God set you free. And yet, the Spirit will guide you. And where you need to speak up, you will speak. Where you need to stand for justice, you will stand for justice. And God will back you. Remember, love is the greatest power. Uh, our sister, the question you asked, that's one other reason why love is higher than spirituality, love never fails. Love is the greatest power. And as you heard in that same first Corinthians chapter 13, he said, where there is prophecy, they will fail. It will come time where they will end. But eternity is in love because God is love. Pray for yourself. Go ahead and pray. Today is healing. Is there anyone who has offended you so deeply, has wounded you, 
It's so difficult to forgive. Today, we are joining our voices and our faith together. Tell him, Almighty God, I forgive. Because of you, I forgive. As you have taught me, as you have commanded me, I forgive. I keep reminding us of the Lord's prayer. We rattle through it, but we forget verse 12 most times. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if you go to verses 14 and 15 of that same prayer, you will see it says, that's Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 9, I believe. As we forgive, it says, if you do not forgive, your Father who is in heaven will not forgive you your own trespasses. Forgiveness is for our own good. It is a component of love. Go ahead and pray. There must be healing today. It, was, it is not only when somebody offends you. Sometimes trouble, challenges. Some people is even God, they are querying. God, where are you? If you are there, why am I going through all this suffering, all this? You don't need to do that. Just let the Spirit of God take over. Tell him, Lord, I love you. In life or death, I love you. A reference scripture, Luke chapter 10. Uh, Luke chapter, chapter 10, verse 27. It says, so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So we are to love with everything we are. Spirit, soul, and body, conscious and unconscious self, inside, whether somebody sees it or not, and outside with our expressions, love. Let's bring our prayer to a close. Today is the day of healing. That marriage, God will heal, and love will flow in that marriage. As you show love, love will flow in that marriage, in the name of Jesus. That hurt, the healing power of the Spirit of God, take away that hurt, because you have forgiven. Let us pray together. In the mighty name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we thank you for forgiving us all our sins, our iniquities, our errors, our mistakes, our weaknesses, our transgressions. We thank you for forgiving us all. Even now, Lord, again we ask, please, every offense in our lives, may you forgive. Forgive us every offense, every wrongdoing. Forgive us all our sins. All our errors, our iniquities, our transgressions, our mistakes, our weakness, forgive us. And Lord, we stand together and we also forgive whoever has offended us. Whatever offense there is in our lives, we join our voices and our faith together and we say, Lord, we forgive. And now, Lord, I pray for all these, your children, anyone that has been that is hurt, let healing, the healing of the Spirit of God flow through that life now. Let every past offense that has become a hurt be healed now and let it be gone in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for that marriage. I ask, Lord, that healing flows through that marriage now. Let love respond to love. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the, the power of hatred be destroyed, be broken over that marriage. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray for the children 
in that family that yet the, the parents are showing love, yet they are responding with negative, negative hatred, indiscipline. Father, I pray that from today, by your spirit, let love respond to love. Forgive them, O God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Forgive us all and pour out your love the more by your spirit over us in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, we pray for our nations. We plead by your mercy that you forgive our nations, forgive our leaders. And we ask that by your spirit, you will cause our leaders to come to understand justice, equity, fairness, righteousness as an up, a, sub, a subset of law and to practice it. So Lord, we ask that you heal our land. By your mercy, heal our land in the mighty name of Jesus. However, Lord, we ask that you who said vengeance is mine, I will recompense. The wickedness of the wicked will come to an end in our nations, in our society. Deliver the oppressed, O God. Help the poor and the needy, Lord. Stand for those, Lord God Almighty, who cannot fight for themselves. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, our Lord and our God. To you be all glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. And thank you so much for being part of this meeting.